folks. Book of Revelation. We'll be having a baptism tonight. And if there's anybody in the house that's been saved, you need to be baptized. So at the end of the service, you can come down and join and unite with a local fellowship. It has nothing to do with your place in the body of Christ. That takes place from the moment you are born again. Man cannot put you in nor take you out of the body of Christ. Revelation chapter number 1 and verse number 11. John says, I was in the spirit of the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And jump over to verse number 15. His feet like unto fine brass as if they burned in a furnace. His voice is the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went forth a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Father, bless your word now. The holy word of God will not return void. And I pray for unction and anointing for this messenger. In thy name I pray, amen. amen. You can be seated. The book of Revelation, folks, has to do with the last book of the Bible. That's important. The canon of scriptures closed. This is about 90, 95 A.D., somewhere along in there. The canon is closed. I cannot emphasize that enough because stuff was written after this purporting to be the word of God. It is not. This is the Bible. 39 Old Testament books, 27 New Testament books written over a period of nearly 2,000 years. It is God's infallible word. Amen. If you don't have an inspired book, then you surely can't have an inspired faith. Amen. Amen. So the Bible tells us here that he is the Alpha and the Omega. That's simply the first and last letter of the Greek alphabet, which was in vogue 2,000 years ago, spoken all over the world. It was the world, it was the, it was the, it was the language of trade. If you knew Greek, you could pretty well go anywhere and communicate with whatever country you were in. And you could communicate with these people in Greek. At that time, of course, Koine Greek is what we call the common Greek of the la common Greek language of the people. And this is the language that the New Testament is written in. Koine Greek, spoken the common Greek of the people. It's just like English. You have Old English, Middle English, and, and, and Modern English, like French. You have Norman French and all the rest of it. Every language goes through a process of evolution. And so here we have a simple language is Greek, first and last letter. And here we have the first and last letter of the Greek language identified with the Lord Jesus Christ. Says it himself, I am Alpha and Omega. What does that mean? That means that he is the sum total of all wisdom. He's the sum total of all revelation. He's the sum total of all time. He's the sum total of creation. And he is the sum total of life. In plain words, nothing can exist outside of the Alpha and the Omega. He encapsulates everything there is because he's the Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason we have this is to show you the glorified Christ. He is high and lifted up. He's glorified in glory and beauty. He, he was nailed on a cross. There he's, he, he bled, he sweat, he died, he suffered and sorrowed there on that cross like a man would. And many of them no doubt saw that. But here in the book of Revelation, there's no more suffering. Here in the book of Revelation, no more dying. Here in the Revelation, there is no more pain. My friend, we have a glorified Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to notice in Revelation chapter number 5, we have a sacrificed Christ. In Revelation chapter 5 and verse 5, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, Simeon, uh, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah. Judah was the fourth born of Jacob. But my dear friend, because that Reuben and Simeon lost that right that they had, and Levi was set apart as the priestly tribe, then Judah was elevated to the highest position and received the office of priesthood, if you please, to be passed down. And so the Lord Jesus Christ is of the tribe of Judah. Judah in Hebrew means 
Praise. Praise unto God. Now notice carefully what it says. One of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. He said, I will not allow that throne to leave the house of David. David will have the sure mercies of David. And so the Bible says here, Hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. Note carefully, who opens that book? Look at verse 6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the world. They want you to understand that it is the Lamb of God that has the authority to open up the books of judgment upon mankind. While the Lamb preached, He bought and paid for that right. He bled and He died for that right. And 24 elders gather before Almighty God on a sea of glass and they cry night and day, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The Lord Jesus Christ is exalted by angels. He's exalted by the seraphim. He's exalted by the cherubim. He's exalted to the right hand of the Father. And make no mistake about it, glory to God, we will exalt Him. Amen. One day by our voice, blessed be the Lamb of God. Amen. So the Bible says in verse number 6, He stood as it had been a lamb. Now notice the privileged Christ. Chapter number 5 and verse number 9. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. Did you get this? No creature, no place, nowhere, nothing has the authority and worthiness to open this book to send the judgments of God down upon this earth, which was the great tribulation period, the time of Jacob's trouble, but one. And that one bought and paid for that in verse number 9. The sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And we go on down to chapter number 6 and verse 1, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. And I heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And what follows in chapter number 6 are what's called the four horsemen of the apocalypse. These are the ones who dish out judgment damnation and hell fire upon this world. Make no mistake dear friend, you don't even want to be close to this world when the great tribulation comes. There are people out there that are so deluded, they think you're in the tribulation now. No, no, no. This is game time compared to the tribulation. The Bible said men will seek death and death will flee from them. Oh no, you don't want to be here when the tribulation comes. Well, how can I keep from being here? Trust Christ today and call on His holy name and He'll save you from the great tribulation. But then we find in Revelation chapter number 13, the imitated Christ. Revelation chapter number 13, we read the scripture says this, Revelation 13 and verse number 4. And they worshiped the dragon which gave power to the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Satan has always wanted worship. He even said, Had the gall to say to our Lord Jesus Christ, Fall down and worship me and I'll give you the kingdoms of the world. I have the power to do it and he did. It was given to him because he's the God of this world. He has a period of time where he reigns over this earth. But the Lord Jesus Christ said no to him because the Lord Jesus is coming in Revelation chapter number 19 to take the kingdom away from him. Amen. He won't ask Satan to give it to him. When the Lord Jesus comes, he won't ask the earth to give him what's rightfully his. He reaches out with a strong arm and takes it. You see, the day of grace has passed. And men have to deal with Christ according to his sovereignty, his holiness, and the law of God. And you don't want to do that, dear friend. So the Bible says here we have in verse number 16, Revelation chapter number 13. He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might sell, buy or sell, save he that had the mark 
or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. And here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Listen carefully to what I'm about to say to you. This world is going through a plague right now. And you have to be head with your head in a hole somewhere in a cave not to know that. And I hope you're beginning to see the unfolding of the control that the governments are exercising over people. I hope you begin to understand now something, folks. God is a gracious God. And He gives you warnings upon warnings. We have now in play airlines that will not fly you unless you have a card stamped that you have received the vaccine. And so therefore, if you can't get the vaccine, you can't fly. So what are they doing? They're controlling your movement. And the time is going to come when they control your buying and selling. We have wild governors all over this country that have shut down small businesses. We've got people right now have lost their homes. They've lost their hard-earned things because of some wild governor that shut it down. What's that? That's control. And the way the, and the, way the vaccine is administered, the way it's given out, that's more control. You're in the very beginnings of it. You're watching it as it begins to develop before your very eye. Listen, I'm not a prophet, but I'm going to tell you something. If something doesn't drastically change, you're going to watch this world change like you've never seen it before in your life. And who knows if there's not another one coming down the pike. Who knows if there's not another plague that's going to come forth from Wuhan, China or somewhere else. Who knows? Them people are already being brainwashed they're being controlled. And my friend, listen carefully. You don't want to be here when this thing unfolds. And you can't buy, you can't sell, you can't move, you can't do anything unless you take the mark of the beast. The vaccine is not the mark of the beast. But the vaccine will back you up against a wall where you'll take the mark of the beast. It's a tool. It's a weapon. And that's where we're facing. So the imitated Christ. But in Revelation 19 verse 11, we have the coming Christ. Amen. She sang about him just a few minutes ago. And I was all sitting over there and sister was singing. I said, hallelujah to God. Who else would know that? A whole song about the second coming of Christ. Amen. Revelation 19 verse 11. The, the text says, and I saw heaven open. And behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he that judge and make war. That ought to stir your soul. That ought to move you. It ought to grab you. That one day the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back to this world. And he'll come back as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. Amen. He won't be coming back asking questions. He won't be coming back to die. He won't be coming back to bleed. He'll be coming back to take what is rightfully His. And He'll do it, folks. In Revelation 11 it says, And the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. One war after another war after another war after another war, scratching and fighting and killing and bleeding and dying over land, over land, over land, over control, over control. They call it hegemony. It's a country's reaching out to protect and defend itself. And when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, He'll take it all. Come. John said, come. You say, well, wait a minute, preacher, let us get it to you. No! Come, Lord Jesus. There's no hope here. They're not going to change anything. I've observed it for 74 years, and the only direction man will ever take this world is down. He'll kill you in a heartbeat to survive himself. He'll kill the most vulnerable. If you don't think so, walk by the abortion clinic and see how many babies. And not only that, they make a business out of it. They sell their parts. Oh, yes. I'll guarantee you one thing. If, you could, if, if it doesn't make any sense, somebody's making money on it. Yes, that's an old axiom, and that's true. And so you thought, well, the abortion just had to do with ending a baby's life. No, there's a whole industry involved in buying and selling the parts that come from that little baby. And now we say, somebody said, there's 60 million of them that have perished in this country alone. And one day those 60 million will be lined up one side, lined up down the other side. And as far as the eye can see, I mean 60 million is a bunch of people. 60 million people is about the, about the population of France. 
60 million about the population of Great Britain. 60 million about the population of, uh, of uh, Spain. And, and Germany's about 80 million. That's a bunch of people. And so as far as the eye can see, 60 million babies. And look at the little things. They weren't born, had no time, they couldn't breathe, didn't, didn't give them one moment of life. No, 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 no. No! They go in and they destroy the little thing. But the day will come when they'll sing to the glory of the Lamb. You see, you can't take their soul away from them. Don't fear him that can destroy the body. But yea, I forewarn you whom you'll fear. Fear him that can destroy both body and soul in hell. If your preacher told you there is no hell, it's because he's going there. Be awful careful about that. Be awful careful, dear friend. I've watched this world, and I mean I've watched it. I've observed it. That's just my nature. And I see people out there that deserve to go to hell. They're working at it as hard as they can. And I'm telling you, that's where you're going. Are you one of them? You don't have to be. You don't have to be. You don't have to go there. The greatest tragedy of hell is the fact that you don't have to go to hell. Amen. Amen. In Revelation chapter number 21, verse 22, we read about the reigning Christ. Revelation 21, verse 22, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty, the Lamb of the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. Oh, what a light that'll be. And what a day that'll be. Oh, what a land that is fairer than day. And by faith we shall see it afar. So the book of Revelation gives you a glorified Christ, a, sac a sacrificed Christ, a privileged Christ, an imitated Christ, coming Christ, and reigning Christ. And that's just skimming across the top of the surface, surface of it. The Bible says in the book of Matthew chapter number 11 and verse number 19, his enemies said, he's a friend of sinners. Oh boy, that's a horrible thing. He's a friend of sinners. Well, you know what? That's the truth. A sinner ever had a friend like that friend? There's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. There's a friend that understands everything about you, where you came from, who you are, all the bad bricks you had, how you've been stabbed in the, in the back, talked about like a dog, treated like a dog. There's a friend that still loves you in spite of all of that. Can you imagine the ignorance and stupidity of these religious leaders when they took a woman taken in adultery and drug her before Christ? Well, that's the best place they could take her. <laughs> Amen. In their ignorance, you see, they had no idea. Religion does not know how to help you. Amen. The only thing religion can do is drag you down. And that's what they were doing. They wanted to destroy her. She was cannon fodder. They wanted to use her. And they brought her to Christ. God bless your soul. Amen. Have you seen how the hand of God can work and use the wrath of man to praise him? See what's going on here? Their motive was entirely wicked and vile, and yet God still used that for the glory of God, and he helped the woman. Go sin no more. Where's your accusers? They all had gone and drug her to Christ. Listen, folks, if you can get somebody to the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the greatest thing you ever did. Now pour in the oil and pour in the wine. Yes, you do that. That's what the Samaritan did. The man fell among thieves on the road to Jericho. Jericho's an accursed place. It's accursed. Anywhere you go around Jerusalem, you go down. Anytime you approach Jerusalem, you go up. And so he was leaving Jerusalem and he was going down to Jericho. He was on a road down to destruction. And he fell among thieves. The Bible said they, they assaulted him and broke him and left him wounded and dying on the side of the road. And the, and the Samaritan, listen, Poured in oil and wine. Oil is the anointing. Wine is the joy and the healing. He poured it into his wound. And he took him to, a, to an inn. And he paid for the inn for him to be taken care of. You know what he was doing? He was telling this Jew... He was telling the keepers of the law. He was telling the ones who were the light of the world. Romans chapter number 3. The ones who taught the ignorant Gentile. A Samaritan was a half-breed Jew. He was teaching the whole Jewish nation. Christ was. You got it on your head. But you got nothing down here in your heart. And here's what he did. He opened the door. So that he could come back. And tell him about the Lord Jesus. This is why I love feeding little children. 
This is why we take care of St. Jude's Hospital out there that, that take care of the little, little children with cancer. You wouldn't believe that I heard one of the great scholars in this country not too long ago say, Oh yeah, they got St. Jude out there and this and that. I thought to myself, Hoss, <laughs> if your little boy or your little girl was dying with cancer, you'd take them to St. Jude? I would. And did you know they don't charge a dime? Not a cent. And they treat those little children. And they said years ago, only one in five children survived cancer now only one in five die man have they turned it around you ought to do some serious praying about saint jude that's one of my favorite places on the earth where they help those little children amen you see when you help them you show them that god cares for them you show them that he loves them and you show them that it's not all about your religion well preacher what if they don't become a baptist i don't worry about that God will take care of the Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian stuff. Don't worry about that. I want them to know the Lord Jesus. That's what I want them to know. I want them to know Christ. Then I want them to get into their own Bible study. I want them to do their own praying. You say, we got a good preacher, good. But don't believe everything he says. Because some preachers, only thing they'll preach is the party line. The only thing they'll teach is the party line. What's the party line? It's the official document that they, had, that they subscribe to for their denomination. This is why they don't like me. I'm ostracized. They never invite me to the boys' club. <laughs> they don't want any part of me. I thought, well, that's awful. Well, I lose so much sleep at night over that, you wouldn't believe. Just ask my wife. <laughs> Let me tell you the one I love and the one that I signed up with and the one that matters to me is the Lord Jesus Christ because he poured in the oil and the wine and he brought me to salvation. Called him a friend of sinners. They said he was demon possessed and illegitimate. Mark chapter number 3 verse 22. What about that? Well they couldn't explain what was happening. They couldn't stop it. And so they had to shift it to something else. You see that's what they do. That's a tactic. They still do that today. They demonize you. What manner of man in Mark chapter number 4 verse 41 they said. What manner of man? Never a man spake like this man. Listen. The wind and the sea and the mountains and the hills and the light and all of that. It has no consciousness. There's nothing there except the Creator can say the word and He can cause the wind to blow, the sea to cease, or He can walk on the water. He can bring universes into existence. And when He did in the book of Genesis chapter number 1, in the beginning God said, let there be. The Hebrew word hayah, it means bara is the creation. To bara means to Create from nothing. Then he said, let there be. He spoke, haya. In other words, there's power in his voice to say, to give life and give creation. And we got people today and Darwin's the rest of them. That he's their daddy and granddaddy and he's their Lord and he's their master. And Darwin is nothing but evolution. All Darwin can ever deal with is the creation. He can go no further. If you're a Darwinian today, you can go no further than the creation. That's as far as he can take you. Listen, when God made this, he could just as easily have made it with age. As a matter of fact, it had to have age. There had to be age when he created this creation. What's you bother? What's bothering you? You see, what's got you messed up? Some classroom where Darwin has gotten a hold of you and you don't believe the Bible, you don't believe Christ, you, don't believe, you just believe this is a bunch of man-made, the opium of the people, as Marx called it. No. There's something in here this morning that if you'll just listen to it, he'll speak to your soul. And my Lord and my God, John chapter number 20, who said that? Thomas. Thomas said, I won't believe unless I put my finger the nail prints in his hands. I won't believe. But you know what? How many of you have known some child named Thomas? Amen. Well, I've known Thomases all over the place. There's a Thomas here and a Thomas there. I've known all kinds of Thomases. You know why? Because people identify with somebody that had a road to go and a path to go to come to faith. And that's what Thomas did. He had to come by his doubts and he finally saw Christ for who he was. And he said, my Lord and my God. And let me tell you something, that confession was real. His confession was real. The Lord said, Thomas, you believe. You believe. That's what he said to him. You believe. 
because you've seen. Blessed are they that believe and have not seen. That's me. That's you. Amen. Are you a believer? I hope you are. I really do. Because we all come down to the end of the road in this old world. We come down to where there's nothing else we can do. Reach up and take hold of God's promises and his word. I've been to the graveyard a lot, folks, lately. A lot. And I pray every day. I pray for these people that have lost their husbands. They've lost their mothers. They've lost their family members by this stinking plague that's come out of China. And we've got people that have been tested positive for COVID-19 here in the church. And they, they, may be facing, they may be facing imminent death. We don't know. But I just found out this morning about another person here at Temple that's been tested positive for COVID-19. You don't have to worry. They're not in here. They're in a, they're in a facility. And I'd say probably 80% of the people in this church have had COVID-19. I've had it. My wife had it. I don't guess I ought to get you to raise your hand, but... <laughs> How many... <laughs> I just figure about 80%, wouldn't you? Just a few weeks ago, I came in here on a Sunday morning, folks. Sunday morning. And there wasn't 15 people in here. Look around you. There wasn't 15 people in this place. It was raging. So we shut down the services for a couple of weeks to give people time to heal a little bit, you know. And now they say that it's spiking again, that it's, it's going wild. Well, folks, you can bury yourself somewhere in a closet and never stick your head out and try to live like that. But I'm not going to live like that. Amen. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And I'm going to make fun of people. I, everybody's got their own life to live. But I'm not going to live like that. I've already told the Lord, if I live, I live. If I die, I die. But I'm going to church. And I'm going to do what you call me to do. And thanks be unto God. It wasn't long after that I got it. But he was gracious to me. It was very mild and minor. That's not to say I might get it again. Who knows? I don't know. I'm not mocking anybody. But my life is in his hands. I feel a lot better about that. Is yours? Is yours? My life. Now, brother, how long were you in the hospital? Six days with COVID-19. One of the worst cases we've had where somebody pulled through it. Sick as a dog for six days in the hospital. Thanks be unto God. Put your life in his hands. Father, in Jesus' name, you've been good to us, Lord. You've blessed us. You've blessed me. My goodness gracious. You have blessed me, and you have blessed my little sweetheart. You have blessed us. You have blessed us. And Father, we got people in this house this morning who've lost that one that's nearest and dearest to them. Nearest and dearest. We've got them in here right now. I pray for comfort. I pray for the blessed Holy Ghost. I pray for comfort, Lord. We pray one for another. We pray for them in Jesus' name. We pray for them. Amen.